The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Introduction will be required. Um, just uh, the only note about here, I, um, if you go to DrupalCampCharlotte.com and go to the sessions, I've already posted these slides um, on there. Um, there's also, I made a zip file of the Jenkins jobs that, that I demo, and, and that's linked to from there too. So it um, gives you a quick get started if you want to. Um, and uh, with that musical introduction, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to kind of shoot through uh, some, some kind of side slides that probably cover a lot of buzzwords most of you have, have heard before. Um, how, many, how many people here like know what the term DevOps means and know what Jenkins is, just kind of in a basic way? Okay. <laughs> um, all right. So most of this presentation is, is, is kind of hands-on and like going through the Jenkins UI and, and, and kind of saying, oh, you can do this, you can do that. So I'm just going to, I'm going to go through these initial introduction slides kind of fast because I think most of them are just background stuff that people know. Um, DevOps was sort of this buzzword movement type thing. It, it started out as a reaction to uh, sort of big, overly bureaucratic shops where the operations team that ran the website and the development team that wrote it were very separate and there was this you know, sort of official handoff process and bug fixing going back and forth took, um, had a round trip time of a long time and so on. And um, it came from development and operations merged together. And the idea was, it had a lot of ideas like continuous integration, sophisticated use of version control and stuff like that, but um, essentially it, it, it kind of stood for this, uh, let's cut the nonsense and just automate as much as possible and get stuff done, right? And then it's sort of become associated, I think, with places that have a lot of over overhead to burn because people associate it, you know, maybe with Twitter and Facebook and things like that. And um, so a lot of individual developers, whatever, are freelancers, you know, so on, tend to dismiss it thinking like that's something I need a whole team for or something like that, even though it kind of started out with exactly the opposite um, things. And my, my goal here is to, uh, my main goal of this is just to show you how you as one person without a team, just as a, as a web developer, can use this, use this tool to make your life a lot better and probably get a payoff within a week. Like it may, it may take you a couple hours to set it up and within somewhere from a week from a month, you will easily save more than a couple hours. Um, so uh, just some background on this particular tool. Uh, it has a website, jenkinsci.org. CI is for continuous integration. It's a Java server that runs. So, you, you know, it's essential technology behind it is there's a WAR file that starts up and listens on a port. Um, one of its keys is there's a huge variety of plugins that kind of go into it. In some ways, Jenkins is sort of like the Drupal of the sphere in that just as Drupal has the terrifying array of modules, Jenkins has a ton of stuff too, and we'll scroll through the list. Um, and it has a pretty good and supportive community. It's open source. Um, it's, uh, I'm not sure it's the best option for every, uh, for, for every situation. There are kind of competitors into it, but it's sort of the standard one, right? Um, and it's the default one. You know, if you're getting started, you're probably not doing anything too strange, and it will almost surely do the kind of stuff you need. Um, the, way, the way it usually runs is there's that one master server, the Java server that runs, um, and then and users interact with it through a web interface. Mm -hmm. Jenkins, in a lot of ways, evolved kind of following, um, I, th I think in some ways it kind of follows the path of how Drupal evolved. If, as it became more serious, people said, we need a command line tool, and the Jenkins equivalent of Drush appeared. Um, 
which I think is common on tools, like once they reach a certain level of complexity. It's kind of interesting observation to make. Um, nodes in Jenkins aren't like nodes in Drupal. They are computers that run something. And so they're generally referred to as workers. And this master Jenkins can reach out to them and tell them to do something and run something on them. Um, and the way we're gonna, we're gonna mess around setting it up, we're gonna have the master and it's gonna run stuff on itself and we're not gonna try to figure out talking to different workers or so on because it's uh, more than you can kind of cover with an hour. It's also one of the irritating parts of Jenkins because you gotta copy private SSH keys back and forth, or not private ones, but public ones, and, and do stuff like that. Um, and so the things that actually run are gonna as jobs. Sometimes people refer to them as tasks, but sort of the official nomenclature is jobs that are run on workers slash nodes. They use those words interchangeably, and the results are called builds. Um, and this comes about because Jenkins was originally made to build complex pieces of software where all the different chunks had to be compiled, and the only way to get it done fast enough to have any reasonable turnaround for testing and so on was to build all the chunks in, in, in massive parallel. Um, and so a lot of this terminology comes from thinking that you're taking a big software project you're putting like one library or one component across 50 different workers, you're compiling them, you're getting builds from those, which are then aggregated by another process that produces like the final build. Um, and so that, that just explains a bit of the, yes? Yes, that is, that is a great question. Um, we won't get into that in what I do here, but it's the first thing you'll run into when you set it up. So the question is, um, is there any piece of Jenkins that is required to run on the workers as opposed to the, um, uh, the master server? And yes, so there's a user and it has a um, uh, essentially kind of a restricted shell, so to speak, and that's actually written in Java. So there is this chunk of thing that you put on the worker that's in Java and it SSHs, but it's an SSH connection to it, and then it runs things and aggregates up log files and so on and shoves them back to the master. Um, sometimes you can fake it without it, because in a Jenkins job that runs on the master, you can just put a command in that does SSH with a particular key, and then, you know, I think it's dash E and like execute some command, right? And so you can kind of in this raw way just run a command on another server, right? Um, and uh, that, that, that's a lot more common than you would think. <laughs> um, if you have a lot of small servers that are running very small, tiny things, like name servers or something like that, a lot of times adding the, the Jenkins worker stuff to it is, is annoying, because then you have to resize that instance up from 256 or whatever if you're running really small stuff. Um, that, that was a good question. Um, okay, so I think what I'm gonna do right now is, yes? Um, they are machines in the sense that you can, you can SSH into them, right? So what kind of defines them as a worker inside Jenkins is, is the fact that you can SSH to them. So the, the question is, what are the workers? Are they machines? Are they bare metal? Are they virtual? And, and inside the Jenkins nomenclature, um, a worker is essentially a place that you can SSH to to run something. So it could be anything, and you could even give your own master several names as different workers. And then when you, when you make a job, you can tag it as saying, hey, this is gonna run only on this worker. And so you might even tag a particular machine with several different workers, just that later you can split it apart easily or something like that. Um, this is gonna be a little bit of the tricky part. Let me see if I can... Uh, increase my font size and so on and well let me first uh, escape out of that um it's part of the recording so
okay? So, um, let's see, I think I have some stuff in the history here. Um, the first command I'm going to run is just app get remove purge Jenkins. The reason why I'm going to remove that is because I want to kind of show you I'm really starting from scratch. And the dash purge in, uh, you know, Debian, Ubuntu, Linux, or whatever, means also remove all the config files. So we're going to really be starting from scratch. Um, And if you were installing this on a Mac or Windows or whatever, there is an appropriate installer from the Jenkins um, uh, install page, and and they're they're pretty good as free software installers go. You know? <laughs> um, so I think in here, there's the app get install Jenkins, which should run pretty quick because it the actual download should be um, installed. And you notice it starts it up and adds it, and at this point, um, see, I'm going to have to make this window smaller too. Is that pretty reasonable? In terms of size? OK, good. So um, I went to localhost 8080, and it had a page there. One of the things I'd like to point out is that it didn't ask me for a login or anything. And so kind of installing it this by default can be, can be insecure, right? Um, and the first thing I always do when I install it is I go into this Manage Jenkins thing. and then one of the options here is configure system. And if we scroll down through this, it has this checkbox, enable security, which in my opinion is kind of like having a option on a car for brakes. But um, <laughs> uh, it really should be on and you can check it, uh, uncheck it if you know you're in a LAN or some secure environment. Um, and it has, uh, so in spite of it being turned off, maybe the one reason why it's turned off is because it's, um, it's kind of complicated. Because it can hook up to all different sorts of uh, registries and LDAP and so on. And you can have it keep its own user database. You can, the way I have it installed here out of the box, it just keeps everything in XML files, but you can have its backend hook up to MySQL. You do all kinds of crazy things to, to, uh, if you're just wanting to um, install it as quickly as possible and, and use it to make your life better, just tell it to use the, user, l the Unix user group database. And that way, you'll log in with the same user as your shell account on this machine. One of the things that you'll do is you'll have to hit that test. And it will tell you that Jenkins has to be in a group, the user Jenkins has to be in a group that can read the password file. Um, and I find this kind of annoying because it goes a little bit against uh, the whole point of this is that it's supposed to be really simple, right? <laughs> but instead, um, we have to add that group. And um, for that to actually take effect, we also have to be for that to actually take effect, we also have to restart Jenkins. And I think on Mac and other installs, it, it, it may not need to do that. Um, and it takes a minute to start up, because it's Java and it's slow. But it looks like that did work. And I will save this. Actually, there's one other thing I wanted to do. Well, now gives me a login. There are now fewer options here. But note that even if you come to it anonymously, you can still see stuff. So keep that, keep that in mind. The, it is default setup, even when you turn on the lowest level of security, you can still like, see the names of jobs and, st and stuff like that. Um, uh, 
So I also always um, check a, uh, a box that simply says logged in users can do anything. And if you're not logged in, you, you, can't, you can't do anything. Unfortunately, you can still see a lot. But, and that's, that's, um, that's reasonable for a developer's um, laptop. So here is anyone can do anything. I'm just going to change that to logged in users can do anything and do save. And at, that, at, the, at this point, like you, you have a working Jenkins that's you know, reasonable to have on your laptop, even if you're in a coffee shop or something. Um, uh, so one of the things I'm going to do just to demonstrate what this is, so I'm going to make a, um, make a very simple job that just like runs LS. And then I'm going to go through the plugins. And then I'll switch back to the presentation and cover some stuff some other stuff. Um, so I'm going to go to new job here. And I'll just name it test job. Let's see. And you almost always check this build a free freestyle software project. Um, these other ones connect up to um, other explicit types of build systems. And so it throws me into the, the, um, the configure panel, essentially, for this job. And it has a description. It has um, various options here. I'm going to run through some of them quickly and ignore almost all of them. This discard old builds will keep it from keeping a log. I'm going to leave that off. This build is parameterized means that when you run it, it'll give you a little form, and you can enter in arguments, like which machine to back up, for instance. Um, there's, of course, a bunch of advanced stuff. Notice it has some source code management stuff, and git is not in there. So it has these build triggers. And if you do build periodically, and you look at this help thing, well, it should come up. It has the standard old cron job syntax. So if you want to make something that runs every um, you know, five minutes to run Drush Cron on your site, that's how you would do that. The key part is that if you go to add build step and go to execute shell, you can just put commands in here that will run. And so I'm going to throw a couple in here. I'm going to put ls, date, and who am I, just because they give output. There's a link here. It should open in a new tab if I click it. Let's see. Did it do that? Or maybe it's not completely ungrade. Yeah, so there's a bunch of environmental variables you can use in here. So if you want, um, if you need some of these things, such as the directory it runs in, or, or the URL, or CVS branch that this build is attached to and so on, you can refer to those in your shell script. So you can get, you can do complicated reporting in here. We will just do a save. And there is now this job. And I'm going to click build now. And you see this little build history box on the side. Each time I run build now, it will accumulate a, um, uh, a, a run there, right? So I, I see a history of the builds. If I click on one of them and then do console output, then I can see the actual results of running that script. And, um, and that's kind of the, the low level, you know, Jenkins 101 run through. So if you had something such as a Drush backup my migrate or address SQL dump or whatever, and you wanted to automate this. This is kind of like a more GUI, GUI-fied and featureful version of cron. Like you can automate that, and it keeps a log history so you can know if it quit running at some point. If I go to the main page of Jenkins, like the top page, it lists all these jobs here. If in the job you put a category, you can separate them out into tabs, so you can keep a bunch of them organized. And this blue ball indicates whether the last time it ran, it was successful or not. And so that's handy. When you have a bunch of stuff, you can come to your Jenkins, scan down it, and sort of see an idea of is the, the system 
working or not. And the little sunshine thing turns to rainy clouds if like it's been failing occasionally within the last 10 runs or something like that. So it's kind of like a quick scan down those little icons. Like all sunny is good. If you see a few cloudy things, you know that something didn't happen some, some time. Like you can sort of quickly see where your system is. In this case, it is running them on this machine. And OK, um, let's, uh, let's go to this job and put a PWD in there, and it'll print out the current working directory. Um, so if I hover over it, you can go right to configure. That's one of the things they added in just the most recent uh, version. It should be in a job working directory somewhere. So that command in bash should print out the current working directory. I'm going to do a save. And I'm going to do a build now. You see how it says build scheduled? And then it appears here. You can have a bunch of, if, if you set your worker so it will only run one job at a time, you can get a bunch stacked up. And then that another box appears right here of the queue. Um, and let's go to the console output. And you see it's running in here. Now, that directory is one of the settings you can put in the job. So that, that was just the default one. But you can set it, for example, set this job to go to var www vhosts um, example.com and then tell it to run, you know, drush, uh, you know, I was going to say drush cc all, but Probably it's not something you want to just be running <laughs> all the time. You have problems if you're doing that. Um, but some drush command, <laughs> like say drush cron. That's actually one of my example ones, is running a drush cron through this system. Um, let's go to manage Jenkins. And let's go to this manage plugins thing. And you see something here that you know, talking about how complex systems kind of evolve toward the same things. This is essentially like the Drupal modules page. You have the ones that are available for update, the ones that are installed, the ones that are available and not installed. And they don't have as many as Drupal, so they can afford to have an available tab that's just really, really long. Um, and the main point I wanted to make here is just that there are a ton of plugins that do various things. Like almost anything you want to connect to um, or have it produce or something like that. Um, so some of them are funny. Like there's the Chuck Norris plugin. Instead of the blue balls, it shows a picture of Chuck Norris. And the more failures there, there are, the angrier he gets. And the final <laughs> picture, he's actually in the karate dress, like getting ready to kick your ass. Um, uh, actually, we, we can inst let's install that. Um, <laughs> and uh, so you notice ones that attract to harvest um, every kind of, so here's the source code management related. And I want to install the Git ones in particular. Um, we have to search for Git in here. Yeah, that's because I was, I was practicing <laughs> this uh, last night. So that's just the git oauth. That's something else. You know, so there's an IRC plugin so that you can tell it, if the job fails, put a, a message in this IRC channel. Um, and I think uh, Drupal.org has some, uses that. Yes, normally, um, by default, a, a fail is when that shell script, you know, returns zero, just like, you know, shell commands normally return zero or one at the bash prompt. And I think there are, of course, plugins that do all kinds of more complicated stuff. You can have the, the script produce a chunk of XML with, like, some complicated stuff in it, and it can have, like, many different return types other than, you know, the zero or one. Um, so I don't think I need anything other than that one. But um, just scanning through here, you can see all kinds of other things, like Jira plugins. Um, 
that post things to, to Jira uh, stuff, um, Redmine. Like there's um, one of the reasons why this is like the default technology to go to isn't because it's necessary, it's the best. But Jenkins, by its nature, is something that connects to a lot of different stuff. And this thing has the most plugins to connect to other things. Um, so I'm going to click Install Without Restart. And it's and you notice how it went and got dependencies too, just like a good Drush DL command. Um, and hopefully I'm on the internet. Um, and it'll go and it'll install those. After we install it, just like if you add a module in Drupal that you know um, adds more fields to certain content types or something, if we go back to that job page, we'll see that we have a lot more options that are derived from um, uh, from each one of these. Let's see why it should be running stuff. Well, it's doing something there. Maybe the internet was a little slow downloading it. And so it'll go through there and install it, not unlike um, installing an install profile in, in Drupal. Um, and I think it is kind of interesting to look at this and look at Drupal and look at other big CMS systems and see how they all kind of had the same things. Like I think a lot of CMSs built really complicated user interfaces and then got angry at them and made a command line interface without <laughs> fixing the u user interface. Do you have a question, Doug? The question is, um, can Drupal trigger a task? And the answer is yes. If you go in, in, those, um, uh, in those jobs, there's like a little trigger section, and you can have it trigger on all kinds of different things. Like you can tell it to uh, trigger on a cron job, but you can also tell it, hey, I want you to trigger anytime someone calls this URL. And it'll give you a URL. And then you could have Drupal just, just curl or wget that URL. And that would be the simplest way. But um, given that uh, Jenkins is what it is, as you may imagine, there are a lot of other ways too. You could have it trigger something off of IRC. The most common complicated trigger is to trigger when someone uh, merges a commit to a specific branch in Git. So a common way that, that Jenkins is used is someone commits to master, and Jenkins says, oh, the site is updated. It gets the code, puts it there, runs Drush update, uh, update DB. Um, and, and we'll actually uh, look at a um, We'll actually look at a, uh, an example of that. It's a little bit slow. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I'll, uh, I'll repeat that. He was saying that it can run simple tests and Selenium tests and PHP tests. And there are plugins for all of these so that you can get sort of pre-configured jobs that run this test and report the right output back. One of the, the more interesting and complex and cool setups is to have it on every commit to a staging branch or a master branch, check out a copy of everything, and then run a bunch of Selenium tests. And to do that, you have to have a Selenium worker that has Mozilla set up with the Selenium plugin. So, you have these Selenium jobs that go off and visit particular pages. Like it goes to the register a new user page, puts something in, tries to register it, right? And you can, you can set it up so that worker captures the output of, uh, captures a movie, a screenshot movie of that, of that browser running. And then when you go and click on the job in that little like job results thing, you see the MP4 there. And if it fails, you can click on it and you can see the mouse go around and click and say, oh, for some reason, this tab disappeared or validation fa fails in this form. And you can do kind of end-to-end user-based tests that way and collect you know, archives of them and so on, which would never happen if it wasn't automated, right? <laughs> I mean, and that's, that's kind of the cool thing about this is that if you automate stuff, then all the things you should do but don't, you, can, you, you will actually do them. 
All right, so it says it finally finished updating every everything. And um, I'll just go back here, click on test job, and um, let me click on configure. And my main uh, point here is that now there's additional things that weren't there before. There's this GitHub project link. Um, and down here under source code management, there's now a git thing. So I could do git, and it asks me for different repositories. And so you can, um, in the advanced, you can specify whether git tells the job to run with a trigger or whether you pull git every five minutes, you know, and stuff like that. So you can get into the details of how the two are connected. Um, and uh, and that's, that's the main point, is just that I, um, uh, it's just that we, we added some plugins and now we have a lot more options of stuff to do. And um, a Jenkins setup, just like a Drupal setup, if you just sit in there throwing Chuck Norris type plugins all the time, like you can make it really slow. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, yeah, where is he? <laughs> so I was expecting, because I was on project test job. Actually, let me go back to dashboard. Yeah, I think we might need to restart. Let's see. I have the restart command in here. Okay, so let's, uh, so it should, so now it's still starting up. One of the things about Jenkins is being Java, it's kind of, feels kind of heavy sometimes. Like when you start it, it's not just there instantly. And sometimes the workers use more RAM than you'd really want. And so you have to do little stuff in the um, Tomcat server.xml file and like limit its amount of memory and stuff like that. And so it's back now. I'm not logged in. Wonder if that makes a difference. Yeah, let me just edit the job and see if there's like a Chuck Norris selection. There's some, there's some uh, code of conduct violating plugins too, where like the girl loses more clothing as <laughs> the job gets better and stuff like that. Um, that's a that's a good. Um, that's a good question. The question is, are there any plugins for code quality or matching certain code rules? And, um, and the answer is uh, um, here, activate Chuck Norris. There we go. If you click apply, it says saved. But if you click save, it doesn't say applied. <laughs> yes. There's no status, only commands. See his little description here? And so now, let's see if we go here. Um, maybe, maybe I need to go to the dashboard. So he should be right here. <laughs> yeah. He, he's probably in ninja mode. All right, so getting Chuck Norris will be like homework for this thing. <laughs> um, I think, let me switch back to um, the slideshow and see what else I had in here. So how many people here are sort of familiar with what people call like sort of a basic DevOps workflow where a developer makes things that go to a staging machine and then to a production. Um, does anybody want me to kind of explain that a little bit? I'll just go through it real quick. So they, this hokey graphic, which looks horrible because I made it, um, it, it the, idea, the idea is there's a, there's a developer making things 
there's this, and he does development. Usually at the time that he starts, maybe he hasn't been working on that project for a while, right? So the first thing he wants is, is a fresh copy of everything in case other developers have been working on it or the, the site user has been adding content. So he grabs a fresh copy of the, of the database. This job should also, um, unless you like to live dangerously, sanitize the database, like change all the emails to a test email and set all the passwords to the same thing or whatever because you know, maybe this developer is somebody you hired off Renacoder, or you, you, you met him at a boff at, at Drupal camp and, and you're working together. So he does stuff and when he commits, this job is able to commit, we want that to kind of happen automatically. So when he um, adds something to GitHub, automatically it's put on the staging machine and people can look at it, right? Um, this implies that the stuff he does doesn't require you to go into the actual admin and click things to make them happen. So that implies that you're using features and stuff like that a lot, um, which of course isn't always true. Sometimes he, he does have to go there. And then the idea is like um, some sort of project owner or the customer, or maybe you, if you're on your project, you're everything. Um, you go look at it on staging, say, yeah, it looks good. And then we have this job that's deploy which is a manually triggered job, because you don't want stuff to happen on live automatically, right? Where you click that and you say, okay, put this on live, and it goes and puts that code on live and runs updatedb. Um, and uh, some of the DevOps guys get really, really academic about variations on this, but um, I, I go with keep it simple mostly. Um, and so, I think what I'm going to do go through now is just go through and look at, at some of those jobs that do those things. Um, I'm going to uh, just, just copy some XML files that are the jobs in there, restart Jenkins, and, um, and my main point in looking at each of the jobs is just going to be that they're really simple. There are a few lines of script, and then we use Jenkins to tell them when to run. So um, I'll do that. So I have um, I have a zip file of these jobs that's linked to on the web. Um, and, and if you wanted to start with my jobs, which you don't have to, you would unpack this and just copy it in there. So I'm in var lib. I'm going to cd into Jenkins, and it may be in a slightly different place in other OSs, but it's not hard to find. There's some configuration stuff in here, like all those settings for passwords and stuff are in that config.xml file, which is good to know because you want to back that up when your configuration starts getting really complicated. There's a directory here called jobs, and that just has a directory in it for each one of these jobs. So if I go in jobs, if I go in jobs, there's a directory called test job, and if we look in that, what we'd see is a configuration file. That config.xml has all the settings from that form. It's all just saved in there in an XML file. And then there's a builds, which has the directories where the commands were run and their log of when they were run. And, um, and let's see. So I copied everything. this jobs directory and um, okay so what I did there is I copied the contents of that zip file in here so now I have also directories for these other jobs um, there's a cron there's a backup there's a deploy there's a first job, which is what I called the demo job last time I did it, um, et cetera. If you unpack the zip file and pack it in there, you might have to change these um, usernames before Jenkins um, sees it. And usually I have to restart Jenkins to get, to get this to see them when I copy the jobs in. So let me do that. And now, 
if I reload from here, I should be logged out again. And it's re restarting. And as I wind up toward the end of these jobs, it will be a good time if you guys want to know, hey, can Jenkins do X? We can actually just try it. Um, so now I brought it back. All those jobs I put in there now appear because they're just a XML file, essentially, that I copied into the right place. Um, they're gray because they've never been run before. Um, and I'm not logged in, but um, again, note that in like this, default really simple setup if um, even if you're anonymous you can see some stuff so um, just keep that in mind and uh, I guess I should have mentioned the first time around that if you go into the manage Jenkins you can also restrict what IPs can visit the, the, the machine and stuff like that um, so I'm now logged in and um, and so I'm gonna run through uh, I'm going to run through some of these um, uh, jobs, and um, and so I'm actually going to start out with the, these top three that are not part of that that little cycle. But if you're just trying to use Jenkins to spend less time doing sysadmin stuff and get more time getting paid to work with Drupal, these might be some of the first ones you'll set up. So here's this cron for kitchens one. Um, and as, as you might um, think, uh, it's set to build periodically. It runs it once every 10 minutes. And it has a shell command, which changes to the Apache user and runs, and runs, um, uh, and runs Drush cron. That's very, very simple, like something that People normally put in the cron thing. I like to use drush cron. You could put the wget cron PHP in there. If you if you do drush cron and there are like PHP errors, they'll get captured in this console log, so that you'll be able to see them, and that's kind of cool. Um, one of the things uh, I did in this one is I did discard old builds and keep only three days worth of builds, because if it's running every ten minutes, this build history will will fill up forever, and, uh, and you, you will eventually run out of disk space. <laughs> um, uh, and, but I want to keep some, because if I discover that cron's not running, like somebody says, hey, our search isn't updating, and I go and I look in there, and oh, cron's not running. I kind of want to be able to see when it quit running, so I can tell them, oh, it quit running because of X, instead of just saying, I fixed it, which like leaves people with this feeling of uncertainty. And that's one of the things that I think as a like freelancer or if you're the only computer guy at a small business or something, that, um, that kind of gives you like a big uh, a level of professionalism once you have those logs. Like if you have a problem that's your own boneheaded mess up <laughs> um, and you go back and say, yeah, I messed up. I messed up on Friday and it hasn't run from, from then until Wednesday. Like it just makes you look like you, you're keeping track of what's going on. And if you can like show them this and say, oh, here's what happened, you know, it, it, you know, it, just, it just raises your status a little bit. It makes you, you know, more professional. Um, and given that this is like easy to install on your laptop or your, your server if you're a one-man shop, you know, it's kind of a, a nice win in that, in that regards. Um, let's go here. So it also has an email notification. So when it fails, actually, so when it's unstable, that means that it started failing, it sends an email. If it keeps failing, it doesn't send additional emails, but it sends an email when it quits failing. So that does, causes it not to spam you with a bunch of emails, but, and you know that each email like indicates something has actually changed. And we have an IT at Four Kitchens. Um, In this case, in ten mi within 10 minutes, it will f try to run and fail. And it will fail because um, there's no var www4kitchens.com directory on here. 
So that that command will fail and it'll give back a shell a shell with zero or one, whatever the failure thing is. Yeah. What? Right. So that that's that's a that that's a good question. The idea is like what constitutes a failure of a job? And by default, when you create jobs, what constitutes a failure is whether those shell commands are turned to zero or one, which means that you could run a drush command which could say, um, oh, no such blah, blah, blah. But if the drush command returned to the shell the right thing, it would look like the job didn't fail. And then this could happen a long time and build up, right? Um, and so you have to think about that when you write your command. Sometimes people you know, collect the return with the dollar the dollar sign syntax in bash shell and then like, you know, return that or, or something like that. Um, you can also like capture the output and if there's, for some commands, if there's any output at all, you want to fail because that means messages came out. And so you can capture the output and that kind of stuff. Yes. So the question was, can you set up custom graphs for them? Yeah, grep. grep. You can set up custom graphs. So as these shell commands get more complicated than drush cron, and they, as they get past like the five lines of that little window, if you find yourself expanding that text window and making it bigger, it's probably time to stop and write a dedicated Python or PHP script, whatever your, base, whatever your sysadmin script is. Put that script in the right place and make sure that script returns the right thing, and then just call that script in one line from there. And that's, that's the way most people evolve in their setup. So usually what happens is their jobs get bigger and bigger. At some point, they realize, I really hate editing in this thing. It doesn't match curly brackets or whatever. I have this complicated shell command. And then the epiphany comes on. I'll cut this and put it in a file and then just call it from here. And that's, that, that's, that's probably the best way to go. Yeah. So, so, so the question is, let's suppose you're not a one-man shop, you have 10 programmers, you know, who does the setup? And do you just let programmers jump on here and be creating jobs that run on production, or, or how, do you, how do you do that? Um, the answer is there, there's a lot of different ways to do it, as you might imagine. Uh, Jenkins has ways to organize things into tabs and give people only specific permissions. So just as Drush, just as Drupal, Develop this ridiculous permissions page that we all hate. Um, if you go and you do the manage by project matrix option <laughs> in Jenkins, it'll give you a list of all the jobs, a list of all the people, and then you can check whether they can build it, whether they can see the build results in addition to running it, whether they can edit the job, and so on. And typically, people do something a little more restricted than that. They have like a bunch of development machine jobs, and usually, developers can do any anything there. Um, and then there's either an entire separate Jenkins installation or a separate class of jobs that run on production. And usually um, that's more of a, you know, the most white-haired person there <laughs> um, is, is, is kind of is kind of managing that. But I would advise that you make it so that everyone can see the jobs, so that both they can see the script in some way. Like even if they you have an rsync that copies the config XML somewhere or something, right? Because sometimes when you're trying to debug something, you don't realize that, hey, we updated these jobs on staging to do something right. It never happened on production. I don't understand what's going on. You also want the developers to be able to see the history of the jobs. In really big websites, a lot of times things start taking longer and longer as like databases grow bigger or whatever. And you want to kind of push that information as far down the chain as possible so people can realize, you know, hey, ever since I did X, you know, cron is taking 10 minutes instead of five seconds. You know, maybe I should think about that <laughs> or, or something like that. Um, so let's just hit a couple more of these um, jobs. This one backs up the, um, the V hosts, the file installs on a particular machine. One thing I didn't point out on that other one, this one also has the discard builds. This one has this restrict where this project can be run. And we were talking about workers and so on. What I did is in the Manage Jenkins, I created a worker and I gave it a, a name. And I said, to do this worker, you SSH to this machine with this key and set that up. And what that is telling um, 
in Jenkins here is that when it runs this job, it should run it there, right? And you can set a, set a job so it can run anywhere. So like if it was like a generic processing type thing, it's like grab the least busy machine. Jenkins is set up to do that kind of stuff, but that's kind of not what we usually use it for in DevOps type stuff. Usually there's a particular machine you want to run something on. Um, and in the way that, that, that you would probably set it up for yourself, initially you would not restrict that thing at all and it would always run on your, your laptop. And then once you set up a, say, uh, a, a stage or a dev, then you could um, put those in there. Um, the first step that I would do when setting up workers is usually people have a server and their stage is kind of a different vhost on the same server as production. And you can just create two workers um, and then just set later in case you split it apart, but have them point to the same machine and run stuff that way. Um, so let's just look at the script. Um, this one's build periodically, not triggered. And as you can see, it's just a simple little CD to somewhere, make a tar file, type backup. And, and usually if it gets much bigger than this, then you really should be doing something else. You could also trigger a more sophisticated backup system from here. Um, and that last line on there, that find command, that's where I delete all the backups that are older than 10 days so that I don't keep filling up the disk. Um, where are we on time? Okay. Um, I'm going to skip the, uh, the MySQL backup thing. That just does a MySQL dump. It's pretty much the same. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this one. That's the first step in that chain. What this does is it SSHs to production, does a dump of the database, and it copies it to a particular temp directory so that developers can reload their database and start from a clean stage. And it's, it's pretty simple, and it actually should be more sophisticated because it should sanitize everything. Um, these two jobs are almost the same. The main thing is that this one you have to click on to run, and this one, you, um, this deploy stage runs automatically. So let's look at that one. And again, I am careful to discard the old builds. And this one is hooked up to a GitHub project, which is just has the Drupal that runs the pressflow.org site, which is the simplest Drupal ever. It's a splash page, it's kind of massive overkill. But um, that Pressflow was the worker I set up to go to the Pressflow production machine. Um, and it's giving that error, of course, because in this setup I just made, I never made the workers. And I didn't want to, because I'm, I'm kind of scared of doing something where my laptop accidentally click, connects somewhere and does something. I haven't, this is all key-based passwordless login, so it'd be hard to do that accidentally, but I still don't want to. <laughs> um, there's the source code management and the git and the repository there. And um, this branch specifier with star star just means master. And this is set up to pull the git every minute. It has a warning there to try to get you to not pull it every minute. Um, and actually right now on live, it's, it's set up more to, to pull like every hour or something. But uh, it was set like this when I copied them because someone was in the middle of development and doing stuff. Um, and then there's a shell command that essentially um, updates that server, right? So it does a git submodule init, git submodule update, because we were using git submodules on this project, which I think we got frustrated with and quit on all our other projects. And then it does the update db dash y. And the dash y means that um, when it asks you for yes, no, are you sure, it's going to do it automatically. So that runs. And then it has a notifier if it fails to run. And so with all of these things, the main point is that there's just a few key lines in here. But you never forget one of them because you've put them in one place and now it's automated. I'm getting really close to the end here. So I'm going to jump back and um, I'm going to go through my slides. I'm going to go through them really, really fast because I think um, I think for this audience, um, people probably uh, grasp all the all the basics. 
So there's the point about this flow requiring features and update hooks and so on and trying to get everything into code as much as possible. I think that's a, something people have figured out. Um, I have this thing about why you should use Drush Cron instead of Drush. In addition to the error messages, you can also give it a lot more RAM if you actually have to have it do some serious processing and then keep the PHP limitations on your Apache uh, low. Um, for most audiences that do this, I do a poll of the audience and ask how many people are backing up their website right now, and a lot of them aren't, and I go on a little rant about how they should do backups. And, um, and that's pretty much it. My main point here is that you can install Jenkins and get a payoff of it without you know, having to spend all week on it or lose money on it, and you will save time and will make you look you know, more professional, you'll screw up less, it'll make your life better. Um, if you need examples of those jobs or maybe you want some other jobs that are more compli complicated, you want to know if maybe I've set some up at Four Kitchens, I could send to you, just uh, send me an email. And I also wanted to end with a plug for that bit.ly uh, URL goes to uh, the online web form survey for the Drupal camp. And um, you know, sometime uh, before you go home and forget it, you should do that maybe towards the end of the camp. And um, maybe we have time for one question. That's a great question. He says, best practices, you have dev, prod, stage, where does the Jenkins server live? On a very small setup, you usually stick it somewhere like on stage or somewhere convenient. The main key is it has to be where it can SSH to all the other machines, right? So you can't, sometimes it can't be inside a LAN. Um, or sometimes you have to have another Jenkins inside a LAN because there are backup machines that you don't want to be able to get to from the outside. And it has to go from the outside, grab your backups from the cloud and bring them back, which is the way, so I actually have two Jenkins running you know, at Four Kitchens, one inside, one out. Um, you, can, you can run it on your laptop. Eventually, most people, uh, because of security concerns and so on, if, you're, if your setup gets very big at all, you have a separate server. Maybe it's the same server where you uh, have your Jira and, and other stuff running, or your Redmine, and you put Jenkins on that, and it's sort of out of the chain of things. Um, you have to realize that if the Jenkins server gets hacked by somebody, it has keys that allow it to log in as the user bender on all your machines. And so you do have to keep that in mind from the security point of view. And uh, I think that's it. I'll be around for the rest of the camp, obviously. So um, uh, ask me anything. And I have these slides already on the Drupal uh, Camp Charlotte website. So you can download uh, the PDF or the ODP. So uh, anyway, thanks. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event 
uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk 
allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Astros cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Astros convoit communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.